folks, you are now listening to the new Pine Talk. My name is Brian, 33YN2. I'm a community team member for Pine64. You will find me pressing buttons in Discord to ban bad bots and writing secret documents. And my name's Justin, also known as Porky of the Pine. I'm a member of the Pine64 community, and you might know me as a guy that really loves SXML. We'll be the hosts of this new segment of Pine Talk. Wait, new segment? Indeed. There will be two monthly podcasts, one called Pine Talk and one called Pine Talk for what it's worth. Each segment can be up to around 30 minutes in length. The For What It's Worth monthly talk will be focused on mainly gossip and bringing on others to chat, and we'll have two separate hosts. So now there's Pine Talk and the cooler Pine Talk. Well, you can decide which one is cooler for you. Don't worry, I will. We'll also be introducing new artwork for the podcast. This is something that a community member had contributed for the past iteration of the podcast, but it was never used. Let's dig in. Wait, wait, wait. But before we actually get into the podcast, I need to warn everyone that we are all highly anticipating the PinePhone keyboard, Qi wireless charging, and fingerprint reader backs. Uh, however, there has been a development as of this recording that means we do not have the information on when these devices will be available. We will keep you posted next month, and we are sure that you are just as excited as we are to get your hands on them. Late last month, we announced the dev zone was being made ready for testing, and in the past few weeks, lots of feedback has been gathered. We will now be accepting more participants aboard and have started reviewing applications and sending invites. For those of you that do not know what the dev zone system is, I advise looking at the July update on the Pine64 blog. An important note is that once the system is populated with developers, there will be an introduction of bounties to the platform. Only developers on the dev zone will be eligible for accepting bounties. The funds for these bounties have been raised by the Pine64 store. Into the PinePhone news. It has now been two years since the first PinePhones entered production. In January of 2020, end users received their first Braveheart PinePhones. Since that time, the mobile Linux community as a whole has gone a very long way in just a short period of time. If you're interested, you can check out the Pine64 blog posts called September Update Blog of the Year 2019 for a glimpse at a very early prototype PinePhone with a clear plastic case. On the topic of the PinePhone, the Pine64 community has been experimenting with a new Anbox alternative called WayDroid in the past few weeks. Anbox, in case you don't know, is a compatibility layer for Linux that lets you run Android in a container and therefore its apps. Unfortunately, Anbox is rather slow, and it has lots of missing functionality. However, WayDroid promises to solve some of these problems by not only introducing a newer version of Android within the container, but also a focus on Wayland support. Danked, a developer in the Pine64 community, has packaged a test build of WayDroid for his community build of ArcLinux ARM, and which has made its way into the Manjaro repositories as well. It is not without its problems, as it often crashes, slows down, or displays really interesting issues such as inverted colors. However, it is extremely promising. Megapixels, the go-to camera application for the Pine phone, has received a new update. In version 1.3, the image quality is now much better thanks to improved post-processing, and this is bringing better colors and contrast by default. Eventually, users will be able to configure the post-processing within the app. Hopefully, there's further improvements with post-processing in the future. I can only imagine how it might turn out. Now, the objectively best UI for the PinePhone, SXML, did receive the version 1.5.1 update earlier this month. The biggest change in this was the switch from XDM to TinyDM. This allows the PinePhone to automatically log in on boot, and it is now recommended that you use full disk encryption if you plan to daily drive your PinePhone with SXML. Additionally, all SXML packages now fully support both DWM and Sway, with that, the project is very close to the release of SWMO, which, as the name implies, uses Wayland. This update also brings many small quality of life updates, such as hiding and displaying the cursor depending on touch or mouse input, and the flashlight toggle has now been moved to the main system menu. The objectively better UI for the Pine Phone, Plasma Mobile, just kidding by the way, had a new Plasma Mobile Gear 21.08 release for the 31st of August. This release of Plasma Mobile software includes more bug fixes for the keyboard, fixes for landscape orientation usage of K-Clock in Plasma Mobile, as well as a new loop timer feature, a bug fix in K-Weather that fixed an issue where overly thick lines would be rendered, a few fixes for Spacebar, Plasma Mobile's SMS application, a few minor bug fixes for Casts, the Plasma Mobile podcast application, 
as well as a new feature that lets you change location where podcasts and images are stored on your device. Now moving over to the newest edition of the Pine64 family. First impressions of the Pine Note are looking mostly positive. The device is light, natural to hold, and comfortable to carry in a backpack. It has a very sleek, industrial look, and the display is a strong contender against leading e-paper products. In terms of software, Linux is booting on the Pine Note, but currently PG Wipeout's Quartz 64 kernel does not detect the eMMC flash memory and the e-ink panel has not yet been enabled. While this still has a long road ahead of it, the current progress is incredibly promising. And a new community member has contributed a section on the PineCube for this month's Pine64 blog post. He has shown, using the pre-built Armbian build from the wiki, that he can get it to connect to local Wi-Fi and be powered off a micro-USB cable to act as a security monitoring camera, which saves MPEG clips from the camera and posts to a private matrix channel with notifications to different users. He mentioned that he wishes to try using it in an outdoor setting, using an acrylic dome to seal the device, and powering it with power over Ethernet via a splitter cable. Make sure to visit this month's blog post on the Pine64 website to read more about this interesting project. I just wanted to quickly reiterate what was said in the blog post about Pine64 trademarks. There are detailed guidelines available on the Pine64 website outlining what can or cannot be done with the Pine64 brand as a whole. There have been some community members who have requested permission to make merch for Pine64 and who have been given the go-ahead for doing so. Neither the project nor the store will be profiting from these ventures, and hopefully those plans go well. I really, really need more Pine64 stickers. Initial tests of the Pine Dia were showing a lot of promise. If you want more information on the development, you can check out Lup Yin's article in the blog post. Any attempt I can make at explaining it would not do it any justice at all, so I'm not even going to try. But just to warn you, the article goes into a lot of detail. Moving over to the Pine Time, Infinitime 1.4 marks the 1,000th commit added to the Infinitime project. This version reworks the touch driver, reducing latency to near zero as well as other app improvements generally making the user experience far more pleasant. In addition, a feature called Pink Grapefruit has been added to let you customize the colors of your pebble-like Pine Time style watch face. This feature is found on the third page of the settings menu, and I know exactly what I'm doing once we're done recording this podcast. Of course, this update also brings a slew of other improvements and bug fixes, all of which are linked in the blog post. Continuing on the Pine Time software news, WaspOS has seen a couple major improvements in the latest Git commits. Support for the BMA425 accelerometer used in the recent batches of Pine Times has been added finally. The heart rate sensor's values have also been adjusted in WaspOS so that you can receive more accurate heart rate values. The weather app has received some crash fixes and a fix for a bug that caused incorrect weather data to be shown, and most importantly, an issue affecting distros with GCC11 compilers that has led to some users breaking their Pine Times with the worked WaspOS bootloader has been patched with the workaround something I'm sure many people will be glad to see. And on that note, I just want to mention that while WaspOS has not had any recent number of releases, it is not abandoned. You can currently build it from source. It is recommended to grab a copy of WaspOS bootloader from a past number release so that you know it is well tested in order to avoid breaking your sealed watches. The people who were affected by the GCC 11 compiler issue were using an untested bootloader they built from Git. So grab WaspOS from Git and avoid the Git bootloader. So that was a fairly short list for this month. But how did you feel about the episode? We feel like there's a lot of room for improvement, and we're sure that you, the listeners, may have suggestions for the next episode. You can contact us on Twitter, Mastodon, or through email. There's also a channel on the official Pine64 Discord that you can leave us a message in. That's all for this month.